There is too much carbon in the air. Yet we continue to take carbon out of the ground in the form of hydrocarbons, burn them and put them into the air. And we do that because hydrocarbons are really useful fuels. We use them in our cars, in our planes, in the production of concrete um, and of the smelting of metals. So it's not easy to uh, sort of solve our addiction to hydrocarbons. But what if instead of extracting them from the Earth's crust, we could extract them from the air itself? This is the plan of Dr. Casey Hanmer. He's the CEO and founder of Terraform Industries, who intend to do just that, to mine the air. Casey uh, has a PhD in astrophysics. He's worked at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, so he's literally a rocket scientist. Uh, and in fact, many people will know Casey for his wonderful blog on space, on the industries uh, around space, SpaceX and, and developments there. Um, he also flies planes. So <laughs> he is a really, really accomplished guy. Uh, and I find it great cause for optimism that someone like Casey is working on a problem like this. We're going to talk about how a combination of a centuries-old technology, the Sabatier process, uh, in conjunction with electrolysis, in conjunction with the game-changing economics of solar power, how, how costs continue to come down, and, and as we d deploy more solar power, we expect them to come down even further how these things are going to combine and make it cheaper to extract our hydrocarbons from the air than from the ground. I'm James Robinson, and I live on a planet where we have a carbon dioxide concentration of about 420 parts per million in our atmosphere. That's too high for us. But in another world, it's getting better. This is Multiverses. Casey Hammer, uh, welcome to Multiverses. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, so I've, I've worked in startups for about uh, a bit over a decade, and I've heard a lot of talk about companies who want to change the world, which typically means that they're going to put some pixels on a screen and sort of tweak human behavior. Um, your company, Terraform Industries, as the name suggests, is trying to change the surface of the earth. Um, so what do you do? We're, well, if anything, we're trying to keep the surface of the earth the same. Um, that is uh, at a fairly steady temperature. Um, but I guess in a single sentence, our, our overarching goal is to smoothly displace fossil oil and gas as a primary energy source for humanity by providing a, a better and cleaner alternative that is cross-compatible and cheaper. And so that, that alternative is methane, I guess, um, produced by uh, renewable energies, specifically solar. Um, and my cheeky change the surface of the earth is, is kind of envisioning, envisaging a world that's, that's covered in, in solar panels, which I think is um, sort of a part of the plan. Um, so yeah, could you could you unpack it a little bit more? Um, how do you how do you create this 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 alternative fuel? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and to be clear, at world scale, the the, the price of getting off fossil fuels forever is deploying a lot of solar panels, uh, but ultimately very few on land that is already utilized by humans, and somewhat less, uh, maybe ten percent uh, of the total land that humans already use for agriculture. So. Um, the net impact is actually uh, rather low, possibly even negative. In terms of you know, the nuts and bolts, um, chemically speaking, humans use hydrocarbon fuel, which is you know, gasoline or petrol uh, for their cars and, and, and diesel and kerosene for their trucks and planes and a natural gas often for heating, uh, electricity, cooking and other purposes. Uh, natural gas is also used in some vehicles. Uh, natural gas chemically is, is methane or methane uh, or CH4, which is the... the, the, the the shortest, the simplest of the hydrocarbons. Uh, and that is the reason we started there. But our process in, in principle can extend to make any uh, hydrocarbon or, or even a plas plastic materials um, that, that humans depend on and use in such vast quantities to safeguard their health and well-being. Um, and so our, you know, our, our principle is to 
uh, is to produce those synthetically. Uh, so in order to make a hydrocarbon synthetically, you need both a source of hydrogen, which is the hydro part of hydrocarbon. And, uh, and for that, we simply split the hydrogen off water, H2O, using a process called electrolysis. This process has been known about uh, since the 1800s um, and, uh, and commercialized at scale since the early 1900s. Um, and then uh, we also need a source of carbon. And um, you know, historically speaking, people have used coal or, or trees as a source of carbon. Both of those are, are limited. Uh, both of them have fairly substantial uh, economic and sorry, um, climate, uh, environmental externalities. Um, for us, we, we seek to use uh, atmospheric CO2, the carbon dioxide that's in, in, in the atmosphere as a source of carbon uh, to make our hydrocarbons, uh, which is actually how, how plants grow as well. Uh, plants, plants derive the carbon in their bodies from, um, from the air as well. Uh, and so we have a, a process to filter the, the CO2 out of the air and, and then convert that uh, using a chemical reaction uh, back into the fuel from whence it most likely came uh, sometime in the last 50 or 100 years of frenetic industrialized uh, hydrocarbon consumption. Great. So so in a kind of nutshell, the ingredients are uh, water, which gets electrolyzed um, to, to create hydrogen. Uh, and I guess uh, oxygen is, is obviously a, a byproduct as well. Um, and right. then you're also you're, you're taking carbon dioxide from the air which is is there in pretty low concentrations although concentrations that have gone up appreciably over the last 300 years um and have caused lots of problems um extracting the carbon dioxide from the air combining with that hydrogen uh and you end up with with methane and uh i guess some uh oxygen by the electrolysis and a little bit more uh water right is is that the kind of some, some water uh, comes out as well yeah um uh, the, the process is actually quite a bit more complicated than this, but but we have uh, numerous blog posts and so on available on our website uh, and on our blog blog.terraformindustries.com. So if you're interested, listeners who are deeply into chemistry, they can they can delve into the finer details there. The really neat thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that um, this process can be almost completely self-contained. So right. uh, as you say, CO2 is relatively scarce in the air; it's about one part in two thousand, um, but but actually, if gold was present in rocks at one point in 2000, that would be considered an exceptionally rich, rich source mm -hmm. of gold. So it is, um, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of intermediate in its value. Uh, we'd, we'd have to filter a lot of air uh, to get the, the CO2 that we need out. Um, but, you know, it, it can be done. Uh, this is a process that's routinely done in submarines. It's done in spacecraft. It's done in medical applications. It's done in, in certain kinds of scuba diving uh, kits as well uh, to filter the CO2 out of, out of, uh, out of air streams that humans depend on. Um, and actually kind of one of the neat things about processing such huge volumes of air is that if we need a source of water, we can also obtain that via direct condensation. So, uh, you know, we, we envisage, you know, eventually trillions of acres of solar panels and, and our chemical plants deployed in very remote regions without infrastructure, without, uh, often adequate water supplies, even, even underground. Uh, and in such cases, we can actually, uh, not only generate a, a stream of, of fuel, which can be transported to market via pipeline or via trucks. Uh, but we can also uh, generate a, a modest stream of water, both to supply our process and also potentially to supply local communities or, or you know, conduct some limited irrigation uh, on site, which is which is kind of a neat trick. Um, and 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 all of this is possible because it's driven by by solar power. Um, and of course, plants plants are driven by solar power too, right? So like in some senses, we're doing what plants do. Um, but because we have access to metals and silicon and uh, advanced technology, we're able to. Um, uh, produce roughly a thousand times more fuel per unit area of land than plants can, uh, which is a pretty neat trick. Yeah, indeed. And, and that's interesting about the, you know, the water coming off as a, uh, as a byproduct. Um, I, I've not seen, I, I've seen that you have an interest in sort of desalinization and other uh, means of creating uh, fresh water. Um, but I've not seen you write anything about this, although it struck me that maybe it was uh, on your mind. Um, so, so I guess, you know, because carbon dioxide is relatively low concentration, as you said, like uh, about 400 parts per million, um, you've, you have to sift through lots of areas, you say, to concentrate the CO2. Like, that gives you the opportunity to also extract uh, a lot of water from water vapor. Um, I guess even in places which are very dry, um, very low humidity um there can still be, you know even at five percent or lower that's a lot of water in the air compared to the concentration of, of 
of carbon, of carbon dioxide rather. Um, okay, that's that, that's cool. So, is this something then that could be deployed, like pretty much anywhere, or do you need? Um, let's see. Um, do you need water to get it going, or could you just put it down in the desert and um, one of your uh, kind of mini factories, as it were, that's producing um, fuel from the air would just get going? I think practically speaking, you would want to deploy them by the hundreds or thousands at a time um, just to make sure you have a meaningfully large flow of, of fuel coming out. Uh, even though you know we can produce a thousand times more fuel uh, per, per area than plants, um, that, that fuel is produced con continuously, whereas you know plants typically harvested once per season, um, you know, like crops are harvested once per season. Um, so, you know, there's kind of a consideration there. Uh, and then, you know, obviously like um, the, the primary constraint on the land is that it's available and cheap. So, um, so, but, but yeah, it's kind of neat. Like you could, you could imagine airdropping one of these in, in the middle of Nevada somewhere, you know, uh, provided that you can get a, a four wheel drive road to the site, you know, then that's basically all the, uh, all the infrastructure that's needed to make one of these work, which I think is really neat. Okay. Uh, the, the really transformative thing about what we're doing here is that not only can we do this, we think we can do this cheaper than drilling a hole in the ground. So, so maybe not today, but within say 10 years time, even without subsidies, uh, anywhere on earth, even if you happen to be sitting on top of a, a very rich supply of, of oil and gas, you know, some parts of Texas or Middle East or whatever, it will probably be cheaper to make hydrocarbons using our process deploying on the surface without drilling any holes in the ground, without getting any fossil carbon out of the ground and putting in the atmosphere, um, than it will be to, to go on drilling. Uh, and you know, drilling is a, is a difficult and in many ways dangerous business. It's quite high risk. Uh, it's also financially risky uh, in that you know, a lot of, an awful lot of dry wells get, get drilled over the years. Um, whereas our process is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, there's a very, very high reliability is, is guaranteed out of the gate. Um, and you know, there are you know, associated hassles with operating on the surface and you have to deal with dust and vegetation and so on. Uh, it actually seems to us quite likely that uh, if we cover sufficiently large swaths of the world's arid areas and solar panels, that it will probably uh, modify the local climate a little bit, um, probably make it slightly, um, slightly more conducive to plants growing, uh, which is, mm. which is fine as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, it's a, it's an important thing, but I, I, one of the things that I'm, I'm deeply concerned about uh, in terms of human progress is that is that for the last 50 years, which is essentially you know, most of the lifetime of most of the people who are alive today, um, humanity has had to deal with fundamentally scarce supply of hydrocarbons. And for people like you and I, who, who kind of live at the very top of the pyramid, uh, it's not, not, a, not a major constraint for us. Um, but for the vast majority of humanity, like even obtaining access to hydrocarbons is, is not necessarily straightforward, um, certainly in, in the quantities and at the costs necessary to you know, do productive economic development. Um, and you know, and really, the cost of, of of hydrocarbons for you know useful applications in mechanized farming or transportation uh, with you know, personal cars or, or aviation is really cost prohibitive. And and there are, there are a number of reasons for those. You know, obviously, some countries lost the ge geopolitical lottery. They don't they don't really have uh, you know, access to seaports. They don't really have the, the economic development. They don't really have their own oil and gas, um, which which is is not great for them. But it turns out that the, the vast majority of the world's population lives essentially within a day's walk of a place where they could in principle grow food to live, uh, you know, grow enough food to live. So, you know, until, until the advent of refrigeration, essentially all the world cities had to have you know, nearby uh, agriculturally productive hinterlands that could produce enough food to supply that city. Um, and the human population distribution has not changed that much since the invention of refrigeration in part because uh, the invention of refrigeration came along as part of industrialization, which at the same time also caused a collapse in birth rates. So, um, so it just so happens that like 98% of the world's population essentially lives somewhere where it's sunny enough to synthesize hydrocarbons with a electric synthetic process, like the, sorry, solar synthetic process, like the one that we're developing, um, which is super compelling, right? So like now, if you're a human being that just happens to be born in you know, Africa or central Asia or South Asia or, um, South America or whatever, and, and you live in a country which does not have, you know, adequate political organization to ensure reliable supply of energy <clears throat> via what is considered conventional means today, like having a super tanker show up at your highly developed port or whatever, um, it's not a problem. You know, you can essentially locally finance and construct solar array and synthesize 
uh, natural gas, you can synthesize gasoline, you can synth- synth- uh, synthesize um, various kinds of plastics, whatever you may need uh, within your own community or within your own city, um, which essentially, you know, kind of removes that that layer of like global competency and coordination uh, from your ability to get enough energy to make your life not suck. Um, I, th- I think this is super exciting. And, and actually, when you look at the 2% of humans who, who don't live in places where this will work, it's basically Finland. So I always feel a bit sorry <laughs> for Finland. They gave the world Linux and and in return, they get no solar synthetic uh, energy. But um, but actually, the, there's, you know, there's copious supplies of wind, wind energy and so on at that far north as well. So I think you know, if we don't really screw this up by the early 2040s, the vast majority of the world's population will be able to uh, derive a cheaper fuel from synthetic processes that are carbon neutral. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. So the, the sun is, is a great leveler here instead of you having to win the hydrogen lottery and, and find yourself standing on an oil field or a gas field or, or what, what have you. Um, you just need exactly the same resources that you need to let the plants need <laughs> because as you point out this is actually chemically not a million miles away from what plants do it's a lot simpler it's a lot more efficient yeah. um but it's taking ingredients mm. from the air um carbon, carbon dioxide uh water vapor uh, and creating hydrocarbons um that's and right. sunshine obviously um yes I actually lots, lots of, some of the country- solar power yeah, lots of solar power. Um, I live in one of the places, not quite Finland, but uh, Scotland. Uh, I'm always struck by how much of an outlier it is on the kind of uh, sunshine lottery, as it were. <laughs> like we're really low yeah. on that list. Um, well, so Scotland's an interesting one because like really... because like the population density in Scotland is still pretty low, in part because mm-hmm. my ancestors left the place uh, and went to Australia, um, and, and obviously because of the clearances. So like, you know. In principle, you could probably pave the moors with with solar panels and produce enough hydrocarbons to get by. Uh, in practice, I suspect that the British Isles will will do better via wind power and nuclear power, um, and, and possibly leveraging their blue water navy to import hydrocarbons from other places. Um, but it's kind of a special case um, that um, yeah, basically like Britain, Den- Denmark, and, and the rest of the Nordics are kind of a special case uh, in, in this instance. But like, it's important to remember that. That Scotland is what, 56, 57 degrees north or something. It's like uh, at, at most other places on the planet that are that far north are essentially very, very inhospitable climates. Um, yeah, yeah, like we're talking like Anchorage or something. Like uh, it's just not, not, not particularly pleasant. And and the human population density is quite low. Britain is kind of an exception because it, because of the Gulf Stream, it's warm enough, um, and it does it is sunny enough for like enough grass to grow to like feed feed animals and and uh, and have some agriculture um so it's an interesting one i i was looking actually this this might interest your listeners um for, for a while with a couple of my friends we were looking at like what would it take for wind to compete with where solar is going to be in 10 years mm. or, or in 20 years and and i you know i'm i'm as thrilled as anyone by the incredible developments that are going on with offshore particularly offshore uh, wind power and i think it's it's actually particularly illustrative that uh, despite the enormous productivity of the north sea oil uh like oil area, I guess, um, oil exploitation area, um, which, you know, something that was all happening when I was a kid. Um, it's, it's now kind of the situation that, that if you were able to mount uh, a sufficiently large wind turbine on, you know, the, uh, the remaining uh, oil platforms out there, that they would generate more energy, uh, per decade or more energy per dollar invested, um, than further oil exploitation would. Um, so this is yeah. this is an interesting kind of transition point where where if you've got a, a huge pile of money that you want to invest in in generating energy that involves like screwing around with marine access in the North Sea, are you better off just doing wind power than you are doing oil drilling? Even though the North Sea is relatively shallow, um, yeah. And the same thing goes with coal, actually. So yeah. Uh, so actually, I grew up in a place that's pretty close to Newcastle in Australia, which is one of the world's major major coal uh, mining areas, just as Newcastle was in Britain, um, but. It's kind of got to the point now where, you know, unless you find a ten foot thick, a three meter th- thick seam of coal uh, at the surface, which you're not going to do because uh, all the good stuff's long gone, um, you're even, even then you'd be better off just using it as a foundation for solar panels. Like you would make more energy and more revenue over twenty or thirty year time time span uh, doing that than you would by digging the coal out and selling it. Um, you know, which is also very encouraging. Yeah, yeah, I mean. I- I think that's uh, fascinating, and I, I guess, I mean, 
this seems almost central to your thesis that solar power is becoming so cheap that it, instead of it being used for the sort of, um, I guess, low entropy forms of energy like electricity, um, which are sort of, you know, seen as the most high value forms, it be starts to make sense to do something which may seem very counterintuitive, which is actually turn that into, in some ways, less valuable forms of energy, um, at least from some kind of thermodynamics <laughs> accounting, um, at the cost, obviously, of also, um, you know, losing some of that energy in this process. So I, what I'm going with this is, I think there's a dominant theme in, in sort of um, net zero transition that electrification is, is the way to go, um, because it's the way that you hold on to as, as much of the energy that you're you're producing via renewables as possible. Um, but you're saying, well, you know, let's not electrify. Um, let's let's produce hydrocarbons in a carbon neutral way, if you like. So none of that, mm. you know, none of the carbon that you're um, putting into those fuels is coming from the crust. It's all coming from the air. Um, yeah, maybe walk us through why that makes sense. Yeah, sure. So it does seem kind of crazy. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm very pro electrification. And I think that there are certain applications where electrification is is already very competitive. Uh, and, and I expect that its lead will widen. Uh, so we've already seen, you know, electrification long ago of mechanical motive power. So like, it's very unusual now to have like a steam boiler driving a turbine in a factory in order to get shaft work to like operate a lathe or something like that, right? You just have an electric motor. Um, and, and what we've seen over time is that like the, the technology that allows you to electrify things has, has kind of improved. So like, uh, electric heat pumps are now significantly better, not just more efficient, but better over terms of overall cost value, uh, than, than heating in homes uh, for heating in homes. Um, we're seeing, uh, electric cooktops, uh, induction cooktops, um, have significant advantages, uh, particularly in terms of indoor air pollution, um, in homes. And, uh, and then obviously we're seeing the gradual electrification of ground transportation. So I drive an electric car, uh, which is a fabulous vehicle. It is in, in essentially every way, uh, superior to an internal combustion engine version of the same car. Um, and I think that, you know, Tesla's explosive growth against a backdrop of general stagnation in, in automotive is, is an apt illustration of, of this fundamental truth. Um, and, and I would expect that trend to continue over time. And in fact, uh, in order that uh, solar power get cheap enough that synthetic fuels can be competitive with uh, fossil fuels, uh, electricity must be so cheap uh, that um, that you know it will continue to to drive the, the gradual electrification of uh, you know essentially heating, cooking, and uh, and ground transportation. However, it is also important to realize that uh, electrification really kind of stumbles when it comes up against two major problems. One of them is kind of the quote unquote hard to decarbonize sectors. And I'll come back to that. And then the second is that um, there's just a lot of inertia in, in certain applications. So um, you know, whereas the, the the fleet of cars may turn over every 10 or 20 years, the fleet of buildings might only turn over every 100 years. And and there's just, you know, like when I was in college, there were still buildings that were heated by coal uh, because like <laughs> it was just uh, a significant hassle to change how the how the building was heated. There wasn't there wasn't a strong argument in favor of doing that. Um, for, for better and for worse. And, and the building was seen as valuable in other reasons. So it wasn't just kind of pulled down and replaced. Um, so, you know, for those, for those applications, for legacy applications and so on, I think it's necessary to have a, a deep source of fuel. Um, but then in the hard to decarbonize sectors, there are certainly electrically intensive ways that, that to process materials, uh, say metals, so make, making steel, green steel is a good example. Um, and there are also, uh, I think, really transformative ways in which cheap electricity will make say, um, uh, aluminium, I guess you're Scottish, I'll say aluminium, um, competitive with, um, uh, other say, um, more, more competitive against steel. So, so right now, for example, worldwide, uh, we produce roughly 20 times more steel than aluminium, but, uh, in the future with, you know, if electricity comes down in price by a factor of five or so, um, then, then the relative cost advantage of, uh, steel and aluminium will shift in aluminium's favor for a lot of applications, um, uh, which is super cool. Also magnesium, I would expect to, uh, to to become much more widely used and other metals that are extracted electro, uh, uh, electrolytically. Um, and actually there's also an electric, electrolytic process for extracting iron, which is super cool. Um, 
so you know you could make as you could if you want to greenify the production of steel right you could you could obviously replace uh, blast furnaces with synthetic coke uh, you could uh, fuel the blast furnaces with synthetic natural gas or with ordinary natural gas that you py- pyrolyze and then and install the CO2 or ordinary natural gas and fire it with pure oxygen and then capture a pure CO2 waste stream uh, or you could you could synthesize uh, hydro- uh, hydrogen on site and then use hydrogen as a source of heat uh, because electric resistive heating tends to run out of oomph at about 1,100 or 1,200 Celsius, which is not hot enough to make steel. Um, or you could just go for a direct electri- electri- uh, electrolytic steel production process. But all these different things kind of ignore the fact that uh, existing steel production plants um, have a lot of fixed cost that's already in place. And so the operators of those plants probably don't want to invest a whole bunch of money in ripping out stuff that already works to replace it with stuff that might not work. Um, so that's kind of a challenge there. And so I think in order to service those those needs, it makes sense to have uh, to have um, synthetic fuel available. Um, and then the the most exciting example that I usually bring forward is aviation. So like the shipping as well, obviously, but, um, but aviation is a good example where like, uh, especially long distance uh, flights. So there's kind of two schools of thought here, right? If we want to decarbonize aviation, one is you make everyone feel really bad about aviation and you invest heavily in alternative to aviation, like um, sailing ships and high-speed trains, uh, which are actually not significantly more efficient on a per person, you know, like in a kind of power per person, per mile, per time saved basis. Um, or um, or you, you slap a carbon tax uh, on, on the price of aviation to help offset the environmental damage that aviation causes because it's it's extremely fuel intensive. Um, the, the effect of that carbon tax, of course, is to increase the price of aviation and make it more exclusive and and essentially deprive you know some millions of people in the world from access to the technology of aviation, which essentially allows them to exchange money for time. And you know, at the end of the day, people can always make more money, but they will certainly die one day unless we solve aging. So uh, you know, time is precious, and and I think. You know, from a human human progress point of view, we would probably like to find ways to make flying more accessible to people rather than less accessible. Um, and and one of the ways that you should do that is by not making it more expensive. And so the other school of thought, which is the synthetic school of synthetic fuel school, school of thought, says, well, what if we could make sustainable aviation? Uh, sustainable avi- I'm going to take five here. <sighs> sustainable aviation <laughs> fuel, uh, SAF. Uh, that's why people call it SAF. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, what if we could make SAF? Uh, that was not only uh, carbon neutral, but also cheaper and and a better fuel, like say higher energy density than existing uh, k- uh, kerosene or, or jet A fuel, and um, and just you know produce that all over the world wherever it was needed, uh, uh, then and and thereby reduce the cost of aviation in addition to making it carbon neutral. Would, would that would would that be cool? I think that'd be pretty neat. Why would that be neat? Well, first of all, with cheaper fuel, we can restart the era of supersonic aviation. So, you know, you, me, and the other 10 million or so people on earth who fly routinely, uh, will be able to afford to fly supersonically, which is even more time saved. So instead of taking 14 hours to fly to Australia once or twice a year, I can take four hours to fly to Australia 10 times a year. Okay. Now I'm consuming 60 times more fuel than before. Well, there just isn't enough oil and gas out there to make this work. Like there's no way that, that fossil oil and gas can get us to a future where, 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 you know, the top of the pyramid, you know, economically speaking, people who are pretty fortunate you and i can can afford to fly supersonic aircraft around the world frequently right let alone the next hundred million or billion people uh but with sustainable aviation fuel made from a solar synthetic basis uh then there's no real reason why this cannot occur and um and actually well this might be getting a little bit a little bit off track here but screw it i mean i mean now um <laughs> in, in pre-industrial era so actually the industrial revolution in many ways started in in uh, well, I guess it started in South of England, but but it's certainly a lot of it occurred in Scotland. Um, but prior to that point, you know, talking 1750 or so, um, to a good approximation, the, the total mechanical output that a human had available to them was essentially the amount of muscular force they could bring to bear as uh, personally as a result of of having consumed some food, right? So like yeah. uh, essentially the, the, the gross energy consumption uh, on a per capita basis was roughly equivalent to how much food they could fine to eat, which in bad years would be around 1500 calories a day. So uh, actually starvation was not that uncommon. Nowadays, uh, it's more than hundred to one, right? So like, uh, roughly speaking, I might consume 2000 calories a day, but, but the machines and the car that I drive and the air conditioners that I use yeah. and the planes that I fly on average consume something like 200,000 calories of energy per day. And the really mind boggling thing is that the energy they consume is about a hundred times cheaper than the food that I eat. 
uh, on a per energy basis. So while it costs me five bucks to buy a Big Mac, I can buy, uh, you know, f- for five dollars, I can buy about a hundred times more usable energy than the Big Mac contains in the form of electricity um, or in the form of gasoline, uh, which is one of the reasons why, um, you know, people with relatively modest means uh, can drive cars around, even though those cars are, you know, weigh a ton and move uh, significantly faster than Usain Bolt um, at, at top speed. Uh, and yet still be able to afford it, right? Like if if instead you were driving an animal around at that speed, like, I don't know, a giant uh, mutant crossed uh, cheetah and elephant, um, so that something the size of an elephant that ran at the speed of a cheetah, uh, you know, feeding that animal would would be extremely expensive, uh, <laughs> just, just in terms of the sheer caloric needs that it would have. So I guess the, the bottom line of this rather rambly uh, kind of side sidetrack thing is that today in... Um, in the industrialized countries, roughly speaking, uh, humans consume uh, 100 times more energy in the form of, uh, you know, external to their digestive tract than the energy that they consume by eating food. And uh, ultimately, I think the story of human progress takes us further in that direction. So if, if you know, uh, un- under severe duress, you were forced to think of ways to increase that number from 100 to 1000 so that people consumed 1000 times as much uh, energy than they consumed as food, uh, there are a very limited number of ways of doing that. Um, simply, you know, purchasing more stuff, uh, won't get you there. Uh, simply, uh, turning up your thermostat in winter and turning it down in summer won't get you there. Uh, simply living in a slightly larger house won't get you there. Having a bunch more children won't get you there in order to consume 10 times more energy than you do right now. You really have to move really heavy things at very high speeds. Um, and so, uh, or, or potentially, um, this one's, this one's a bit stranger because it's not quite sure if it should be counted on a per capita basis. But, but essentially, the two major growth areas for energy consumption that I see in the future are aviation uh, and um, a computation. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I thought you might say um, interplanetary travel for the second piece. So I know you've worked a lot on Yeah. I thought a lot about that, but uh, maybe that's well, a little bit further uh, out. So if, if you take on a per capita basis for the people who are actually involved in it, right? So on a per capita basis for the astronauts, obviously, evidently, it is a colossal sum of, of energy. And even if you take it on a per capita basis for the people who work in that industry, it's still a substantial increase in the amount of fuel, like in the amount of energy that is consumed overall. But I think um, if we say right now, you know, aviation, uh, aviation's addressable market is maybe 100 times larger than, 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 it, than the current market is, if that makes any sense. Uh, like if you think of like the total number of flights that people go on, um, and you compare that to the total number of flights that could be gone on if all 8 billion people on earth you know, flew planes as often as we did or whenever the hell they wanted to, um, it would be uh, quite different. Just to give you some rough numbers, right now there's like on the order of tens of thousands of commercial flights in the United States every day. Um, so like even in your wildest dreams, how long would it take before there were tens of thousands of Starship launches per day? Um, and how many people would be involved in that? So it just seems like uh, it's, it's, it's kind of... It'll, in our wildest dreams, it'd be anything other than a footnote in terms of total uh, total energy consumption. I think that's right. And I think also it's the case that we tend to do a lot of short trips um, rather than... Yeah, th- there's some sort of um, probably exponential decay to the trip size that we, we do. Um, so I reckon even when there's quite a lot of interplanetary travel, there'll be a lot more planetary travel. That will always be the case. Right? <laughs> um, I would hope so. I would hope so. Um, I, I would say the other thing is like for aviation, um, the cost of the fuel is a pretty significant fraction of the cost of the of the ticket itself, uh, something between fifteen and thirty percent. Whereas in uh, for rockets, it's not the case at all right now. In the future, it might be, but but right now, that's not the case. Okay, this was a this was a super interesting, uh, I guess, um, set of tangents. Um, I want to get back to. Um, let me see. The kind of original idea was, okay, so electrification isn't the whole story, right? Because there's a lot of legacy hardware um, and, you know, the, the gas network, for instance. And we just get very prosaic here. Um, you know, the UK has a really good gas distribution network or natural gas distribution network. Um, it, ripping that all up, replacing it with um, better uh, a better power grid, uh, it's not an easy project. Uh, and it involves going to lots no. of people's homes, changing uh, boilers, changing cookers. And, and those things will happen naturally as electricity becomes cheaper. But there's no 
there's no kind of it's going to take some time right um and yeah i think, so I suppose, I think like distribution networks that go to residential areas and so on will gradually be disconnected as as the homes in those areas switch over to electrification um and that will potentially require additional investment in um local electricity distribution or like local battery storage or whatever um but that, that's kind of in some ways separate to the the central question of like what is it that we're going to be using hydrocarbons for um and i think mostly we'll be using it for industry and transportation right like, yeah okay so so the, so the that's a smaller piece heating people's homes uh, and that goes the biggest piece is i guess increasing the the gdp of the world by um just supercharging everything that we're already doing by creating mm. cheaper hydrocarbons um and better hydrocarbons as you say for for um aviation we could have um ones which are much denser in energy um well not not much denser but but maybe like 10 percent denser or something like that um okay it just i mean so apparently apparently like um there's a japanese uh, jet a fuel is significantly less dense than american to the point that even though flying from japan to united states is with the prevailing winds like Gulfstream jets and stuff will often have to refuel halfway um, rather than flying the whole way back to the United States, um, which I, I, I think is kind of interesting. Uh, but obviously, if we're synthesizing yeah. fuel, we can make whatever the hell we want. Um, yeah, 10%. In terms of GDP, when... you know, we, can, we can look at a chart of, of world GDP as a function of time. And it's very clear that like something went horribly wrong in the early 1970s when essentially the OPEC countries renationalized oil supply and then uh, and then at around the same time, production became scarce uh, and, and cost became less predictable. Um, and, and I think I think if we can re-secure supplies of hydrocarbons for you know 8 billion people on Earth, it's a fairly conservative estimate that we can double um, you know, GDP growth from about 2.5% to about 5% per year. Mm-hmm. And just that in itself like, is very cumulative over time. You know, after 10, 20, 30 years, like... We end up twice as rich as we otherwise would have been, and that's, you know, that's worth fighting for. Hmm. I guess one thing that some some folks may be thinking here is, okay, so, um, yeah, agree that we want to we want to create new fuels for industry that are carbon neutral. Um, why don't we just use hydrogen, right? Um, and. I, I feel like hydrogen's received a lot more press than um, synthetic fuels, and I guess we, uh, by synthetic fuels, I mean hydrocarbons. Therefore, there is not just hydrogen, um, even though one might think of hydrogen as a synthetic fuel when it's uh, produced by uh, electrolysis. It's I guess it doesn't fit into that bucket. Um, yeah. So, so what's the problem with hydrogen? Why can't we just use that for our, um, you know, smelting processes? Why can't we have hydrogen power planes, um, etc.? It's super energy. You know, it's got yeah. a lot of energy, right? It, per per kilogram, it's great, right? Per kilogram, yes. Uh, per per volume, maybe not so much. Um, yeah. So hydrogen hydrogen has a number of issues. Um, I think there are certainly applications uh, where hydrogen makes a lot of sense and. Uh, it will make sense to use electricity to generate hydrogen locally in in chemical plants and then use that hydrogen to do stuff, whether it's make ammonia or whatever. Um, However, hydrogen as a generic fuel has a number of severe drawbacks, which I think are not adequately de-risked for it to be competitive going forward. Um, They include basically safety-related stuff. Um, The fact that it's not really compatible with existing skill sets or supply chain for you know, standard gas interfaces. Whereas like in the past, we switched from coal gas to natural gas and they were pretty much cost compatible. Um, and just hydrogen is kind of finicky to work with. I mean, like NASA uses hydrogen for the SLS rocket uh, and and a handful of other rockets as well. And uh, But SpaceX decided not to. You know, SpaceX has some of the, the sharpest engineers on earth. They certainly could if they wanted to, but they decided not to because it wasn't worth it. If it's not worth it for SpaceX to use hydrogen as a rocket fuel where hydrogen actually has some limited advantages like why why do you think it would work for cars uh, or planes so the major major drawback with planes is is the density rather than the specific energy or whatever so like uh, energy per kilogram is fine but but actually energy per kilogram is meaningless unless you include the balance of of the system needed to handle it and so if you end up in a situation where 
sure, the hydrogen weighs nothing, but the tank required to hold it weighs 30 times as much. Well, mm. you haven't got anywhere, right? And and hydrogen by itself is, even liquefied, is, is um, more than 10 times lighter than water. So it's... Mm. Um, uh, it's just it's a packaging problem, and in fact, there is actually a, a a pilot hydrogen aircraft which has been doing the rounds in Europe recently, and I think it has like a a fifteen minute flight time or something. It's that, maybe that's wrong, and someone's going to send me an angry email. But like, certainly, it's it's not going to be able to compete with transoceanic um, flights on you know seven 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 sevens or seven eight sevens or a three fifties or a three eighties or anything like that anytime soon. Whereas as soon as you throw a little carbon atom in there and turn it into even liquefied natural gas, let alone jet a fuel yeah. or something uh the energy density like the energy per per unit fuel tank uh volume goes up by a factor of 10 and mm-hmm. you know like nature is trying to tell us something here um hydrogen the advantage of, of carbon you know it's obviously a chemical precursor so hydrogen is pretty useless by itself if you want to make chemicals if you want to make plastics uh and so on um but uh but actually for aviation hydrogen is useful if you're doing a um, a zeppelin, so as a lifting gas, I think. I think you know, if you're building an airship, hydrogen is the way to go. Um, but just as a, as a gas by itself, it has it has a number of nasty properties. Um, for, for those of your listeners who are less familiar, it has a tendency to leak uh, through things because it's such a tiny molecule. So uh, the the tolerancing of, of valves and so on required to deal with it is easily you know ten to a hundred times more fine than other gases, which is kind of bizarre. It will leak through metals. Uh, in doing so, it also makes them more brittle. Um, so it affects the mechanical properties. Um, it's very light, so it tends to float away and collect in odd places. Um, it's odorless, so you, you can't smell it. You don't know if there's been a leak. Um, it has a what's called uh, adiabatic free flame velocity that's about 10 times higher than ordinary natural gas. So, so its behavior as a flammable um, gas is quite unintuitive. Um, it also burns basically invisibly. Uh, so, so unless it's dark, it's very, very difficult to see a hydrogen flame. Um, so if you have a leak that has caught fire, the first sign that you may have, and, and it burns extraordinarily hot, uh, but the first sign you may have that you have a fire is that you know stuff starts melting um, or, or catching fire around it. And, and that's obviously uh, extremely worrying. Um, so all in all, it's, uh, it's actually, you know, I've, I've been making hydrogen bioelectrolysis in, in personal projects and stuff now for many years. Um, and even at Terraform, we've, we've made a lot of hydrogen. We've had one minor mishap um, with with hydrogen, where we inadvertently melted a Bunsen burner, um, but um, it's um, it's it's a chemical that demands respect, you know, in a way that right, you know, like I, I feel like we've made gasoline safe enough that randoms can pull up to a gas station and fill up their car, you know, and we've made yeah. lithium ion batteries safe enough that randoms can walk around with a phone in their pocket, getting dropped on the ground, and you know. Uh, Accidents that involve injury are, are rare enough that they're remarked upon, right? Uh, we've made um, natural gas safe enough that the gas explosions are really you know, quite rare. Um, and also, like, you can build a house with, with generic labor, right? But when it comes to hydrogen, if you're trying to build a rocket that uses hydrogen, like, the Rolodex of people who know how to do that and know what they're doing with it is, is short enough you could probably memorize all their phone numbers. Like, it's, it's just... It's like the internet circa 1983. It's like a small group of people and that's a real problem. So, you know, I don't want to bang on about this forever, but. No, I, I think it's important because hydrogen has received like a lot of press, a lot of investment. Um, and I, you know, it, it's quite striking really. Um, I, I think one thing you didn't mention is is that the, you know, the ignition um, energy necessary to, to, to blow up some hydrogen is, is, is really low, right? It's, um, you mentioned a cell phone falling to the ground. Uh, that might be enough, right? The spark of oh, uh, much less, something much on less. your cell phone. So if you, if you have a mixture of oxygen yeah. and hydrogen, the amount of energy required to ignite it, I think is 0. 0.02 millijoules, which is, um, you know, in, in principle, you could, like a, a fly landing uh, ex- can can dissipate that much energy, right? Uh and and the other the other scary thing about about uh, hydrogen is that it has uh, kind of unpredictable. Uh, so it's, it's, first of all, it's exceptionally flammable. So in in across a wide range of mixtures with air, it it will catch fire. Whereas most other gases have a much narrower range of mixtures where it can burn. Um, 
And then it can do this thing called DDT or, or detonation, uh, deflagration detonation transition where, um, where you have a hydrogen fire and then for basically no reason at all, it, it just detonates, right? So you, and you end up with a, a supersonic combustion front, which is obviously vastly more damaging. Um, yeah, so all, all these things are kind of unpleasant, um, to put it mildly. Yeah, so it's 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 hard to store. It's uh, you know, it, it's not very useful as a fuel because it's so light. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, really all these problems to... can be solved, Even... right? All these problems can be solved. It can be handled safely. It can be dealt with safely, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But they all cost money, right? And so right. once once you end up with a system that's safe enough that it's safe enough for ordinary consumers to use, it it's not even remotely competitive on price, and it never will be. And, and and more to the point, it will never be able to outcompete existing hydrocarbons, right? And it won't be able to outcompete synthetic hydrocarbons. And it has already lost, like hydrogen fuel cell cars had already lost to battery electric cars in like 2006. So I just don't know what, like, I, I'm, I'm going to call out Toyota here. Like Toyota, like, was the absolute pinnacle of automotive manufacturing for after after many many decades of extremely hard work they got there and they held it for decades they held it for several decades right and they had an early investment as did daimler in tesla right and and their engineers who i've met you know they used to come to caltech and try and like recruit people knew as well as anyone else that electric battery electric cars already in 2008 had better performance than hydrogen fuel cell cars could ever achieve even if they achieved 100% efficiency etc cetera, etc cetera, which they were never going to and yet, for some reason, Toyota went and doubled down on, on hydrogen, sold their stake in Tesla. Like, unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Um, anyway, <laughs> I don't want to pick yeah, on Britain because yeah. Britain's had its fair share of, of, of similar mistakes. Maybe it's just a property shared by, uh, by islands that lay off the coast of Eurasia. Um, but uh, anyway. I think making mistakes is a, is a good thing. But uh, yeah, you have to know when, when it's time to throw in the towel and move on to make another mistake, right? Um, yeah. I, well, I guess it's, it's hard to believe that Toyota could, uh, could could throw away its lead that easily. It's just, yeah, it's shocking. Anyway, so so I guess um, I was just going to say, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was fuel cells was Elon Musk's uh, term for fuel cells, uh, which is a nice piece of anti marketing. Um, but yeah, so I guess what what you're doing is taking the you, you do have hydrogen as part of the process, but you combine it very quickly with the carbon that you got from scrubbing the air. Um, and that gives something that's, that's much right, yeah. more, uh, much safer, much easier to handle. People know how to handle it. We have the pipes to do so all over the place. Like um, we have the expertise mm-hmm. to use it. You can produce plastics from it. Um, yeah, you can you can burn it in your cookers if, if, if you want to, although as you point out, like it's- uh, Well, it's incredibly versatile, you know, right? And I don't really care what people use it for, right? Provided they don't vent it directly into the atmosphere out of spite. Uh, which makes uh, you know, methane is not a great greenhouse gas. Um, yeah. Or rather, it is a good greenhouse gas, which is not a good thing. Um, as long as they use it somehow. But the thing is, like, I don't have to specify how they use it. And part of the problem with the hydrogen economy is that is that you know the the development is still stuck in the ideation phase. Like, you know, how might we do this, that, and the other? And it basically comes down to you know a, a live action role play exercise in redesigning the entire industrial economy from the ground up just for fun. There's no real economic reason to do it, and. And so it, it, in that, it kind of, it shares a certain commonality of spirit with, you know, Leninism uh, in that it, 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 it supposes, it presupposes that, that a centrally designed economy uh, could yeah. ever possibly compete usefully with, with a decentralized one. And, and that there, it kind of betrays its, the, the, the weakness of the, the fundamental weakness of the idea. As you say, the ironic thing is that, is that when synthetic fuel plants, if they're using our system uh, or similar are up and running, uh, not only will they be generating vastly more hydrogen every minute than humanity currently generates every year, uh, and, and not only will something like 80 to 90% of the world's electricity be devoted exclusively to producing hydrogen, all that hydrogen will only last for a few seconds uh, before it's routed into a reactor and, and, mm-hmm. and swiftly used to uh, tear oxygens off, off CO2 and then, uh, and, then, and then put the hydrogen, some more hydrogens onto those carbon atoms and make methane. So it's, um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's certainly the case. If if we wanted to build, if we wanted a lot of fuel cell cars, my goodness, we 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 need to replace a lot of stuff, a lot of infrastructure, uh, and that just doesn't seem so easy. Whereas, for example, 
uh, if you wanted to run a lot of methane cars, it's super easy. Actually, um, my, my wife is Argentine. And if you've ever looked in the boot of a taxi in Argentina, you'll have seen like yeah. a compressed natural gas tank. It's, it's just cheaper. Yes, it's the same um, in Sydney. It was done that way in Sydney. Oh. I don't know if it's still the case, but it, but it was very common when I was a kid in Sydney and um, in Central Asia as well. It's quite quite normal for uh, cars to operate off compressed natural gas. Um, but actually, like, so first of all, I think the cars will mostly go to battery electric uh, in the future, as will right. trucks. Uh, second, if you want to run your classic car that runs on on diesel or on petrol right now, uh, that's fine. You can synthesize petrol just as easily, really, as as we synthesize natural gas. I mean, it's like incrementally more difficult, but it's it's something that's well understood how to do. Um, there are, you know, it's people have done it for more than hundred years at this point, so it's 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 very doable, um, and and I suspect that that will also get be done in the future as well. That has to be done for aviation, so right, so um, but most likely. Um, this makes me. I, I want to pick up yeah. on something that you mentioned a minute ago. As as, as long as folks use the um, methane that you're using, you, you don't really mind what they're using it for. As long as it gets used, I guess. I mean, as you said, it's a pretty well, as long as they pay for nasty, it. As long as they pay for it as well. It's it's it, it, it's a fairly yeah. nasty greenhouse gas. I mean, it's uh, I think of order a hundred times worse than carbon dioxide over sort of a couple of decades. Um, so yeah, it lasts, it doesn't last nearly as long. So right. it, it just naturally oxidizes in the atmosphere. Actually, so one of the neat things we can do, because we're filtering out so much air, we've looked into putting a catalytic oxidation, um, basically metallic layer, metallic filter layer into our beds so that uh -huh. you know, we're, uh -huh. we'll be pumping, you know, large swaths of the Earth's atmosphere through our beds every day. And we can use that to, um, we can, we can use that process to incidentally catalytically oxidize methane that exists naturally in the atmosphere, uh, which is a neat trick. So we can, okay. we can take down okay. that. So, so for example, if, if we end up in a situation where we have like massive methane releases from, from the Arctic, cause it's thawing out, then, you know, the only way we can really do anything about that is by, is by putting catalytic oxidation, uh, in, in the, in the, in the, um, in the stream, which we're doing. So, uh, sorry, in, in the stream of, of the air that we're processing, which is, um, which is kind of fun. That is cool. So, so, so you envisage, uh, yeah, the ability to, I mean, if the process is, is, is running sort of in its vanilla format, it's completely kind of neutral, everything that gets produced, um, mm. at least once that methane is combusted, right. Everything goes back to its original place, right? You have as much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, some fraction of hydrocarbons, some fraction of hydrocarbons get converted into plastics and other chemicals, which are right. you know, durable, durable forms of plastic. And actually, you know, one of the thought experiments I did early on was like, okay, so how much CO2 do we have to capture, turn into plastic and then pile up in order to keep up with ongoing oil and gas extraction. And it, it works out to something like you get to build a Mount Everest every couple of years. Um, so, okay. so like you can make these just absolutely colossal piles of plastic that reach into the stratosphere. And in terms of environmental impact, people don't, people think of plastic as kind of a net negative because like it ends up in bird, bird stomachs and turtles and stuff like that. Um, but actually like if you're just, if you're just making a giant pile of plastic out in the middle of the desert, it is so much better for the planet than having all that CO2 floating around the atmosphere. As long as you don't wash the plastic into the ocean, it's not a big deal, right? Um, right. It's just, it just becomes a so just, just big, make big a lot of, Lego, of carbon right? hydrogen atoms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so Lego, uh, what's it? ABS. ABS has other chemicals in it, I think. Um, Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's a pure hydrocarbon. Uh, um, okay. Acrylonitrile. Oh no, it has nitrogen in there. But, but, um, yeah. I mean, you could you could make plastic out of it. Um, we could take a anyway. little bit of nitrogen out of yeah. We'd be you could make you make giant Legos. Long time. You make yeah. Leg Legos. Like you make Legos the size of uh, of aircraft carriers and plug them together. Uh, I like the size of that. Uh, the sound of that. I think people will be very happy with the price of Lego coming down as well. Like this, this should be in your pitch deck. Right? Like Lego has become. <laughs> It's already so much cheaper than when I was a kid. Really? Yeah. Oh, like for me, I, I buy like Lego rockets and things. And for me, the limiting factor is the time it takes me to assemble them. Whereas when I was a kid, obviously right. the limiting factor was like, my parents are too cheap to buy Lego. Um, but I lived in Australia and, you know, the colonies that didn't, didn't have access to the supply chain. Um, well, anyway. I, I, I can see that you're on a mission to change that. Um, 
So let's come back to one thing I guess I, I touched on, which is that, you know, absolutely key to this all working. Um, and this is maybe we've glossed over. It, it's just the price of or the the cost of solar energy coming down. Um, so at the moment, there are, uh, I think I've seen in your blog, some places where it would even now be cheaper to produce um, methane using your process than it is to uh, yeah. buy it on the, the markets, uh, which are, you know, are you getting it from someone who's somewhere uh, extracting it from the ground? Um, and, and that's a striking fact. But for this to take off internationally, um, it needs the cost reductions in, in solar to continue. And I know you're very bullish on that. Um, when do you think this becomes something which um, would make sense? Uh, I don't know, let's say in 50% of the, the global population or, or so. Yeah, so I mean, if you if you follow existing trend lines forward, um, it appears we'll hit cost parity without any subsidies uh, for fifty percent of the world's population by twenty thirty five or twenty thirty six, um, which is you know seven or eight years from now. No, hang on, twelve years from now. Um, so, uh, and this is a fairly straightforward calculation that that we did months ago, um, because you know the solar insulation across the world is well mapped the price of natural gas is, is reasonably well understood in various markets and the population density is also uh, well mapped. So it's not a particularly, actually, I don't want to underrate it. It was a pretty sophisticated calculation, but I'm, I did it anyway um, to, to understand this. Um, now, you know, what, what, one can kind of draw these extrapolations forward and say, well, look at that, you know, solar is going to get 10% cheaper every year at that rate, mm -hmm. you know, a factor of two in eight years and a factor of two is enough to cover the gap between, you know, Arizona and, um, I don't know, New Hampshire or something like that in terms of solar availability. Um, or I don't know, like Southern Spain up to Germany or something like that. So, so, Southern Spain to Belgium in terms of solar availability is factor of two. So eight years and you're done. And of course you might ask, well, why, why do we believe that solar will continue to get cheaper? Right. And, and there's a couple of different reasons for that. First of all, you can take the word of people who are much smarter than me, who uh, spend their entire careers uh, essentially pricing risk on these sorts of developments and then look at the fact that they've already invested trillions of dollars in expanding solar panel production in the United States uh, to the tune of more than a trillion, uh, sorry, more than a terawatt of additional solar production capacity by 2027 coming online. And so global, the global production last year was about 268 gigawatts. So we're looking at like a forex expansion over global production within the United States borders within three or four years, all of which uh, bakes in certain assumptions on cost that basically get us where we need to go. Okay, but maybe they're wrong. They've been wrong before. Um, why is it that solar gets cheaper at all? And the major reason there is that as, as production expands, uh, people you know, have to build new factories and they feed the learning from building the previous factories into the new factories. And so for manufactured technology, uh, not, not all of them, but many of them follow a thing called Wright's Law, which is actually first discovered in the context of uh, price reductions in building aircraft in the Second World War. And, um, and so depending on the technology, uh, you kind of get a, a fixed percentage reduction in in the cost of, of of additional production per doubling of production. Well, that was kind of uh, a roundabout way of saying it, but I'll, put, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Uh, every time you double production of solar panels, the price comes down between 35 and 40%. Um, and this right. is a, a factor that's robustly seen uh, with automotive. It's seen in, in computer chips. Uh, it's seen in batteries. It's seen uh, you know in a whole variety of different technologies. Uh, it's seen in aircraft, obviously. Um, and, and depending on, on the underlying sophistication and complexity of, of manufacturing and a number of other factors basically determines what that percentage is. But if you backtest that, it's been that number for about 50 years now. So like solar has been fairly robustly at 35 to 40% cost reduction per doubling of production now for 30, 30, uh, 40 or 50 years. So why, is, why, why does it do that? Well, as, as the cost comes down uh, over time, uh, the market, the addressable market expands. Right, so demand increases, and then that demand increases by uh, an incremental fraction that is more than enough to make up for the expanded production that caused the cost to come down in the first place. And so it feeds, feeds back on itself in an expanding way. And what you tend to find over time is that the, um, the ability of factories to scale up and meet that demand actually lags increases of demand uh, over time. And, and you would think that as, as the market eventually saturates, that, that, that gap would close, but it's not. It's actually widening for solar. And the reason for that is that people thought that, that that global demand for solar would saturate at about 1%. And, and right now, solar is generating just over 1% of, of global energy. Um, but actually, it's the other way around. 
uh, that uh, a 1% solar is just barely reaching cost parity in a relatively small number of markets. Uh, and its uh, total addressable market is continuing to expand. And if uh, synthetic fuel is correct, not only will it continue to expand until it's at about 100% of, of, uh, of total worldwide electricity consumption, it'll actually grow well past that to more like 2,000%, uh, which is to say that uh, we will end up generating significantly more power uh, from solar in, say, 20 years' time than we generate using all sources today um, by roughly a factor of 10 or 20 uh, in order to uh, convert a large fraction, almost all of that, uh, electricity into synthetic fuels and and thereby to displace fossil oil and gas production, which right now is not really downstream of electricity production. Um, now, this is about to get even more complicated. So hang on to your hats because when solar cost drops by say 10%, the addressable market increases by I don't know, 20%, but that's not always smoothly the case. And and in our case, um, when solar drops down below about 15 bucks per megawatt hour uh, or, or 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour, um, the addressable market expands from uh, basically some subsection of the electrical grid, uh, which is where solar yeah. is addressing right now, to also including synthetic fuels, which is roughly ten times the size of the grid. So uh, we we expect to see you know uh, as as solar cost drops in various markets around the world uh, a dr- dramatic expansion in demand, and that expansion in demand will translate into a vast increase in revenue. Uh, and profit for these industries, which will in turn attract vast numbers of extremely clever, highly motivated, um, and hardworking process engineers into factories all over the world in practically every country on earth, who will in turn feed innovations in, which will not only improve the learning rate, it will also decrease the doubling time. So solar's doubling time historically was about three years. It has already decreased to closer to two years and is well on its way to being less than two years, as it will have to be. Now, it is incredibly important that we keep that number small so that solar production increases as quickly as possible. Because if we don't, then we could end up in a really messed up situation where solar synthetic fuel has reached cost parity or better all over the world, but there's a 10 year backlog uh, essentially waiting for solar production to catch up, which means we will go on and have an additional 10 years or 500 gigatons of CO2 emission because we cannot somehow figure out how to convert the earth's crust into solar panels quickly enough. Um, But fortunately, this industry is mature and it appears responsive to capital. And that means that uh, al- already just the the expansion of of, um, of of production, which is on the order of hundreds of billions of dollars now, uh, has been enough to kind of smooth that out. And so that's why we're seeing these massive investments in expanded production here in the United States and in Europe and, and other places. Um, and so I would say compared to a year ago, I'm significantly more confident that Terraform will be able to scale uh, within that umbrella uh, before we saturate uh, the supply of solar panels and essentially limited in our growth by the availability of solar panel production and its growth uh, forever. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, but I, but I, I, I'm reasonably confident now that that will not occur until well into the terawatts of global deployment per year. Okay. I, I want to play some of that back because I, I just think it's like a wonderful, um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful idea that there's going to be this kind of phase transition where at, at the mm. moment the you can only add so much solar to the grid, right? We don't have That's right. um, we don't have enough battery capacity. Like we're, we're producing batteries as fast as we can, but um, it, they're not great for long term storage anyway. Um, they might be in and, the future. In the future, yeah. Right now, um, yeah. we we the, the economics don't really make sense. But um, you know, we, you you can only saturate your grid with solar, uh, and, and then it doesn't make sense to. To buy more. Plus, we already have a lot of a, you know, source of energy for the grid, which doesn't make sense to turn off. So you can, you know, you can only do so much. But as soon as it becomes cheaper to get your sin, get your gasoline um, derived from solar, um, well, like the demand just skyrockets, right? You, you, yes. You're no longer limited at all. It's it's kind of like you've yeah you've jumped over a valley or something. You're in a completely different potential. This is um, and I guess your 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 main concern here is will the solar suppliers be able to keep up with that demand? Um, and sure, there's going to be well, some they, they, lag, they definitely but... will not be able to, like the, right. like like so if if you follow the trend of uh, cost reduction as a function of production increase. And then you you assume that production can increase infinitely quickly, or essentially as quickly as people can put in new orders. 
then because because every incremental cost reduction expands the market faster than the production increased, essentially you, you end up with a runaway chain reaction. And and so right. you know when I ran this simulation on a monthly a kind of a monthly refresh cycle, it was it was all over in three or four months, which is never going to happen. Yeah. Right? So like solar production will never be able to quote unquote keep up. But if we're lucky, we'll only be lagged by a year or two. Yeah. So I guess in some ways, like the learning rate is less important to your business than just the the rate at which solar production can be increased. Um, and, and those things are probably related. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, I, I don't know so, if, if you have an intuition of how yeah, fast Yeah, so there's an argument be. that you could say, well, can, can we trade learning rate for increased production? Um, and and you could certainly imagine a situation where instead of building one new factory uh, and then feeding its its learnings into the next new bigger factory and so on, every step of the way you just 10x the number of factories you're building, and so you're you're getting 10 times as many factories per unit of learning, um, hmm. and so that would necessarily slow down the learning rate uh, at least the first time you did it. Um, but I sus- I strongly suspect that learning is incurred as you build the factory. So uh, right. Like the, the amount of learning you get from building 10 factories on the identical plans is more than you get from building one factory, um, but maybe less than building 10 distinct factories with individual plans or something like that. But yeah, I, I would certainly, um, and I think, I think the market will reflect that as well, right? Like once, mm-hmm. once we have a, a solar manufacturing plant that is able to deliver solar panels at the required cost to, you know, then service some swath of the world's population, people will copy paste that factory design and figure out how to make the factory cheaper um, so they can make more of the factories faster uh, rather than making yeah. the panels themselves cheaper. Um, I, I think, and that's actually what we've been yeah. seeing in the last few years here in, uh, in, in, since like the COVID uh, supply chain disruptions. There's been a lot of innovation on, on factory production rather than uh, the cost of the panels themselves. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, to some extent, it doesn't matter if the learning rate slows down once you hit that threshold where it becomes cheaper to reduce your hydrocarbons via solar uh, there's no going back right uh great if solar gets cheaper no brilliant right everything gets cheaper but um uh, i i guess for some folks they, they might say okay I'm a, I'm a skeptic here um yes we've had a learning rate but maybe we're on some kind of s curve um and I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here because as you say like this has been going on for 50 years and as long as it doesn't stop in the next few years let's say the next decade we're golden mm. um but you know um yeah is there is there something that could stop us i guess we're we're maybe not the best people to answer this um but it, it, is well, it I mean, just completely but... inevitable or is there something that we're not looking at um well you can you can you can you can play counterfactuals, right? Say, well, what if the learning rate dropped to 5% instead of 35%? Well, we'd still get there sooner or later, right? Um, <clears throat> would the learning rate dropping to 5% uh, cause the markets to expand so slowly that the production rate couldn't be increased anymore? No, it would still increase, right? Um, there's actually a, a paper that came out, uh, Oxford, uh, I guess late last year, um, that pointed out that it basically took a, a brief historical survey of all the reasons why people thought in the past that solar panels could not get any cheaper and mocked them soundly and profoundly in their kind of Oxfordian accents. Um, so, you know, around about 2010, a lot of solar manufacturing occurred in Germany um, and and German manufacturers thought that they basically run out of ideas and then solar manufacturing moved to China and it got 10 times cheaper since then. And that's not because China's yeah. Chinese labor is so cheap. Actually, Chinese labor is more expensive than Mexican labor. Right. So like, um, basically they just took another crack at the problem and solved it. Um, so, and and at the same time, solar production increased by, I don't know, a factor of a hundred or something. Um, it's really, um, it's really quite staggering. And if, and I guess the other reason you you can look at what a solar panel is fundamentally, it's, it's a glorified sheet of paper. Like it's, it's a two dimensional structure made of a chemical that's relatively abundant in the earth's crust using a process that is basically scalable uh, and, and not particularly sophisticated. The Siemens process has been around for 50 years. And in fact, it frustrates me in that it, I feel like it's primitive. It feels like it's like banging rocks together, like kind of level technology. Um, and I feel like our, our descendants will mock us for making solar panels so stupidly. Um, mm-hmm. And if you think about like, what is the essence of a solar panel and how, how would we, if we could arrange atoms arbitrarily, how would we do it to make a solar panel? It would look quite different from the way that we do it right now. Um, 
And so I think we'll probably trend in the direction of, of solar panels that are even, even thinner and less material and even cheaper and faster to process. Right. Yeah. And, and is there a constraint, do you think, with getting them installed? So ha having all these panels, one thing. Um, uh, coming back to this point, you mentioned um, that in some places, so certain areas of Europe, it, it would be cheaper to run your process already. Um, but that's not happening. And I feel like part of the reason here is, is well, it's clearly not that solar is too expensive, but there are difficulties maybe with the large scale deployments. Um, is that something that needs to change? Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of the mechanics of deployment, um, there's a lot of potential innovation, potential for innovation there, but uh, I think we've, as a species, barely even pushed on that because there hasn't been a strong uh, economic incentive to do so until very recently. Um, and so I'll expect it to see maybe a factor of two reduction in total deployment cost and balance of plant cost in the next few years. Um, but that actually the major constraint on solar deployment in Europe right now um, is, is actually not, not due to the mechanics of deploying them in the field. It's regulatory and, and to an extent supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things yeah. that frustrates me is like in the aftermath of Russia invading Ukraine, again, um, it seemed to us that we could probably produce uh, natural gas in Europe. Um, in fact, Europe could produce, uh, essentially Europe was in a position where it was, it was paying Russia a billion dollars a day for oil and gas and, and that it could do that uh, indigenously within its own borders. It cut itself off from Russian gas in just a few years of intensive development with solar panels uh, of, I can't remember how many, like 30 million acres or something, like roughly the area of Belgium of solar panels spread across mm -hmm. the European continent. Um, and um, what's that? Maybe 30 terawatts, something like I that. I never liked Belgium, um, so I think we could just put them all in Belgium, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it will, yeah, let's take a vote on it. Um, half the Belgians will probably agree <laughs> with you. Um, but but, no, but like the thing is, it's, it's not a huge amount of area. It's probably like comparable to the total yeah. amount of area that's used to grow citrus in Europe. Um, so it's not, it's not yeah. and, and, and Europe's not well known for its deserts, but, um, but, you know, easily 20% of, of Europe is essentially unpopulated, um, like non, non economically used land. So there's no shortage of land to do it either. Um, and so like the major constraint then is like essentially Europe would have to stand up like major solar panel factories within its own borders. And even now a year later, like there's been no effort to do that. So, um, as far as I can tell, whereas like, you know, you could imagine, like if they understood the urgency of the situation, like just getting the hell on with it and doing it as, as was done, I think with uh, liquefied natural gas import, importation, where there was like a lot of movement there very quickly. Um, and also to an extent with um, COVID vaccines, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of frustrations and slowdowns there as well, but, but ultimately they were delivered pretty quickly. Um, and the crazy thing is like the total cost of doing that would be like reasonably small compared to the ongoing cost of, of like paying Russia hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Uh, for oil and gas. Um, so I, I found it very frustrating. But the other, the other major constraint, aside from supply chain, is regulatory. And this is actually a problem we see in the United States as well, which is that, um, at least in the United States, the major constraint on deploying solar panels now is is um, what's called the grid interconnection queue. So it's about a 10-year process to obtain permission to build a, uh, a solar power plant and then connect it to the grid. Um, and, and that is due mostly to uh, what's called NEPA, like uh, Environmental Protection Act um, mm. processes, and also um, kind of the, the situation we find ourselves in in terms of like the legality of or, or the legal difficulty of building new uh, power lines that cross other people's land, um, where you know essentially you can end up in a situation where where like every man and his dog gets to line up and say no, and you have to fight them in court for ten years to get permission to build a power line, um, which is. I guess good for us because our process produces natural gas, which you can just put on a truck and move on the road, and and there's no law against that. Um, and and actually, like the hydrocarbon industry by and large is is not particularly struck, like heavily regulated, um, which is nice. Um, but it is also like kind of a wake up call, I think, for us as a species that if we don't get out of our own way, we're going to be in serious trouble. Um, mm. And and I think the same applies in Europe as well. Like if you uh, it, it pains me to have to say this, but if you look at the European response to these uh, large language model uh, tools such as ChatGPT, um, it's it's astonishing just how badly uh, European kind of regulators continue to fumble uh, when it comes to you know 
essentially uh, leveraging new technology. Yeah, and I guess this is, I mean, this is something that you that, that really shines through in your strategy is that you don't want to rely on any um, subsidies. Um, you'll, you'll take them if, if, if they come. Uh, you obviously well, the Inflation lose. Reduction Act is, is huge for us, absolutely huge. Um, but yes, we, 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 long, long term they cannot, they cannot work, right? Like, like once we're at 1% market saturation, the subsidies will be impossibly expensive to maintain for, yeah. for any state. So, so we, we kind of get that, that little 1% for free, uh, in order to scale our processes to the point where we can, we can make it on our own. Yeah. And, and it seems like the model is, is geared to, to work with very small deployments, which I suspect would help with getting, you know, you don't need to solve all these problems, right? Your kind of typical unit, I think, is like a kind of five acre solar farm and then, um, you know, relatively small bit of machinery that sits in the corner, scrubbing the uh, CO2 out of the air and producing everything else. Um, and, and and you're not, you know, your business is, is not going to be um, finding the sites, you know, and it's it's more of a sort of sell the machines, let others figure out how to um, locate them, get around the red tape and so forth. Um, so you're going to rely on the kind of collective ingenuity of a whole lot of people, um, motivated by you know the profit that they'll be making on those um, uh, machines. Is that a kind of fair summary? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like, not fighting against the engine of capitalism is like rule number one. Right. So like the, the key problem with hydrogen fuel cells is, as we talked about earlier, is that, is that not only do they kind of suck on a technical level, um, but no one is going to beat down your door to buy them because they're really expensive, right? They're just bad value. And that's not the case. If, if your product is that, like that, you've got a problem, right? But in our case, we, we believe that our product actually has the ability to deliver huge value for customers. And so it's just... It is just a kind of the rule of the market system under which we operate that if you're able to do that, then rivers of capital flow to your door to make it happen. Um, yeah. Because, you know, the, the market is all about finding ways of getting more money moving. And that's that's what we do. So again, like we can assume, we can safely assume that greed and self-interest will carry the day. And so we want to align ourselves with those forces as much as possible. Yeah. I, I want to touch on a couple of uh, um, things I picked up, which is that, you want to make this, you know, these machines, you're aiming for simplicity over efficiency. I think you even say rather provocatively that uh, low efficiency is a good thing. And then I think that's kind of alluding to the fact that, you know, it increases your demand on solar, perhaps uh, it therefore um, leads to further reductions in, in the cost. Um, no, but- I mean, like, that's a nice, that's a nice side effect. Um, we're not trying to consume extra solar power, right? At the yeah. end of the day, what matters is is the, the dollar value, the cost of producing fuel, right? And any particular design feature you'd like to add or take out, you can calculate its effect on the bottom line. And yeah. so if you want to add 10% so, so efficiency, I- you would expect that that would make it cheaper. And if it makes it more expensive, then you should not add it. And so- yeah. So efficiency is a good thing, <clears throat> except when it's expensive, right? <laughs> well, efficiency when... efficiency is a neat thing because it, it's a, what's called an intensive property. So uh, you can compare systems of different sizes uh, using the same number. Uh, so you can compare you know, a motorcycle and a, and a car and a truck and a plane using the same number of efficiency. The way you do it is you measure like the quantity that you want out, the figure of merit, right? The utility, mm-hmm. and you divide it by you know, effectively the cost, which in the case of energy efficiency is the amount of energy you put in. So like, what is the value you get out divided by the cost you put in, right? That gives you energy efficiency, all right? But why are we, why do we care about the energy we put in? Because energy historically has been a pretty good co- proxy for cost. Energy is the fundamental uh, factor of production. It's the thing that's hard to come by. It's the thing that we starve for a lack of, all right? But we're actually in the process of building energy, right? So it doesn't make any sense to divide energy by energy, or, or you can, but but it, it, it may not be particularly illuminating. What people care about is, how much energy can I get per dollar? You know, how much stuff can I get per dollar? And so energy efficiency is a very good measure of that for certain applications where uh, you're exposed, where, where the application itself is exposed to uh, energy cost in a large way. So a gas guzzling four-wheel drive, for example, uh, a large fraction of its ongoing costs will be paying for uh, 
for gasoline or petrol to fuel it. Um, and where you expect the cost of that petrol to increase over time, right? So then you want to say, well, I want to make sure that, you know, in the future, I'm not paying vast sums of money uh, for the energy to keep my to keep my car on the road. So, so I'd like it to be a relatively efficient one. Okay, fine, whatever. It's all about utility per dollars, right? But if you expect gasoline to get cheaper in the future, then why the hell wouldn't you go and buy a gas guzzling four-wheel drive? You'll end up spending less money in the future. And that's the situation we find ourselves in, which is that we expect solar power to get cheaper in the future. And so there's no point in us investing time and effort right now and trying to find ways of doing this efficiently, right? Like right now, we, we're, very, we're as scarce as we'll ever be in terms of our availability of fundamental resources, like you know, money and time and people and materials and so on. We need to be really careful about what we spend our time and money trying to solve. Is there much point in us trying to solve efficiency? No. Why? Because it's not going to be important in the future. And then in terms of exactly how important it has to be, well, we have a spreadsheet for that. And, uh, and you can put all the efficiencies in at the top, gives you the dollar value at the bottom. And you can, um, you can basically uh, calculate a curve of utility as a function of efficiency. And for us, it, it, uh, the, the, the peak utility is at roughly 50% electrolyzer efficiency, which is still relatively efficient. It's just way less efficient than you know, the state of the art, most efficient electrolyzer possible with known technology, which is about 80% efficient. Um, so it's only you know, a reduction of 30% efficiency is not the end of the earth. Um, mm-hmm. Early steam trains were less than 1% efficient. Like early steam engines, less than 1% efficient. Uh, later ones, you know, push 20, 30% efficient. So, um, you know, like it's, it's, it's far less drastic than the improvements that thermodynamics wrought uh, in, the, in the operation and, and production of, of, of steam engines. Um, I, I think this is really interesting as it, it, it's a bit of a, um, it separates you from some, some other folks in this market where, uh, perhaps just the engineering mindset is to chase after efficiency, um, but you're looking at letting the uh, reduction in cost of, of solar do that work for you, uh, in a sense. Um, so instead of you having to extract a higher percentage of useful energy out of um, the inputs, the inputs just get cheaper. So you just use more of them. And the game is about just building the machines, right? Just building these factories, yep. which are going to uh, run the process as cheaply as possible. Yeah. Um, and that's well, trading getting cheap. building them. Yeah. Yeah. If, if solar is getting cheap, the question we want to ask ourselves is how do we derive the maximum possible utility from solar getting cheap, right? How do we, how do we leverage that to, the, to, the, to our best advantage? How do we take advantage of that, right? And the way you take advantage of cheap energy is by using a lot of it to solve your problem. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's not actually more profound than this. Uh, let's take another example. Look at what SpaceX does, right? A lot of industry experts looked at SpaceX and said that what they're doing will never work because they are using the wrong fuels. They should be using hydrogen and oxygen, which are more efficient, right? And there was SpaceX and they had the same engine for their first and second stage, which ran on RP1, which is a form of kerosene and oxygen, right? And what do they do? Why do they do that? Because what matters is the dollar value to the customer of launching something into space. The customer does not care what the fuel is. They don't care what the rocket's made of. They don't care how the rocket was made. That what they care about is being able to accurately estimate the risk of a launch failure because you can insure against that and the cost per kilogram of putting their object into space. And what Elon Musk correctly recognized was that the hassle factor of using hydrogen would more than outweigh the cost benefit of using it. So in practice, if he had filled up his rocket with hydrogen, he may have been able to launch incrementally more stuff to space, right? A slightly higher payload. But the launch cost would have been probably four times higher. So for four times the money, you can launch 10% more stuff to space. Now, if you're fundamentally limited by the size of your rocket and you're trying to optimize for how much stuff you can launch per rocket launch or how much stuff you can launch per truckload of rocket, then yes, you have to go to the higher efficiency fuel. But that's not a constraint they operated under. And in fact, most of their customers didn't use or used so little of the payload they had available. They're actually able to take their first stage, still full of fuel, fly it back and land it, right? So they end up with, they still end up with more performance than than they needed in most cases. Um, Yeah, at the end of the day, I think both SpaceX and Tesla their products embody performing the cost benefit analysis. Like you want to make a design change, show me that the cost for the customer, show me the value for the customer improves. All right. So 
I can give you another concrete example. In the case of the Tesla Model 3 in development, the, ba- the, ma- the most expensive component of that car is the battery, right? So if you're able to improve the efficiency, now this is where efficiency is important because it derives its energy from the battery. If you're able to improve the efficiency of the motor system or of the aerodynamic cover of the car or whatever by some fraction, you can translate that into a reduction in size of the battery, which translates directly into mm-hmm. a cost reduction. So you can compare the cost of adding a part that improves efficiency with the cost reduction on the battery from that improved efficiency, right? And if that's positive, then you've made a good decision and you can put that des- that design change in. If it's negative, then maybe you should look at something else you should delete in order to continue along that path until you find the optimum. And so in this case, there was uh, some extruded plastic component that fitted into a hole under the car. I can't remember the exact details. The component itself cost, I think, 50 cents, including uh, fabrication and installation. And it... Um, and it, and it improved the error resistance enough that it enabled them to save two bucks and 57 cents on the cost of the battery. So it was a net $2 saving. So it made it in, wow. Wow. right? Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, Tesla did this thousands of times on every single subsystem right. of that car, which is one of the reasons why the Tesla Model 3 and Tesla Model Y, which is basically the same car, are like 50% better, 50% better value in terms of like performance and range per dollar for the customer than all the other competing cars that basically took a car that looked very similar, put a battery with a very similar size, very similar looking motor, very similar infotainment system seats and so on in there, but didn't bother to turn the screws on every single one of those subsystems to squeeze out the maximum value, right? And in the end, it, it, it hurt them to the tune of 50%, which is why you know, Tesla is selling 2 million vehicles this year and their competitors are struggling to sell 10,000. Yeah. Do you see this as the model for, for yourselves to... Look at the details of everything in the process that you're doing and, and and figure out here it's not about efficiency, but I guess it's about making it maybe as robust as possible, as cheap as possible to to, to produce these machines. Um, is that this kind of high level, that's the game? Or uh, is there more to it? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we have a very clear idea in mind for what these machines have to be able to do in order to compete with fracking. Mm-hmm. Right. And so do they need to last for 50, for 50 years to compete with fracking? No. Right? Do they have to look beautiful to compete with fracking? No. What do they have to do? They have to produce natural gas as cheaply as possible. They have to pay for themselves as quickly as possible. That's it. That's the only things they have to do. And everything else is subsidiary or subservient to those goals. And, mm-hmm. and, and if, you, if you internalize that enough, it drives your decision making and it drives it in the correct, in the correct direction. Yeah, I I realize we're we're coming up to probably an hour and a half talking, and uh, while you told me you don't have a hard stop, I I feel like I'm I will I will limiting... have to bounce pretty soon, unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> I'm certainly limiting the amount of time that you're 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 spending making these improvements or building these machines, and uh, therefore uh, there's probably some carbon costs to every word that I'm saying here. <laughs> if uh, no, I think it, I think it's all upside. Things. It's all upside because. Because if, if, if one of your listeners is inspired to go off and try something, it will have been worth our time, right? That's all it takes. Well, I, I can't think of a, I can, I can think of more things to discuss, but I don't think I can think of a better point to end on. Um, so Casey Hammer, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I know you have a lot of problems to solve and I think you're going to do it. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Uh, Thanks so much for having me on your show. It's been a pleasure.